the starting point of my talk is uh, prior egocentric logic, but then I'll move on to a, a recent application uh, within uh, within cognitive psychology. So probably my talk is the least historical of the talks we heard today. Okay. So uh, this is a more detailed plan of the talk. I'll start talking about egocentric logic, then I'll move on, move on to hybrid logic, then I'll go on to standard natural deduction, which I, I suppose uh, many of you know in advance. Then I'll move on to a particular natural deduction system for hybrid logic, which I guess we all know came from Arthur Pryor. And then I'll move, move on to how this is applied in cognitive psychology, and then I'll talk about some further work. Okay, so egocentric logic and hybrid logic. So this is, okay, we have seen that a couple of times today, so I'll, I'll skip that. But this is Arthur Pryor, and uh, he was the founding father of temporal logic and uh, also what is called hybrid logic. <coughs> Pardon? Congratulations. Yes. Okay. So uh, here's a a couple of citations uh, from from prior, and uh, uh, in the first citation here, prior says that practitioners of tense logic are often asked the question: If you emit a general proposition, one that uh, whose truth value depends on what on what they are propounded, why not also admit those whose truth value depends on where they are propounded or by whom? So uh, in more contemporary terminology, and, 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 uh, and uh, I, I apologize if I, I, I switch to multi-radic uh, uh, terminology, but, but in, 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 in a multi-radic terminology here, we have to do with a, a, a crypt or prior model. Now I have to be careful here, but, but in, we have a multi-radic uh, 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 invitation here, and, and, and what we are doing here is that we are taking the, uh, the possible worlds as uh, representing either places or persons. Okay, so, so this is uh, the idea here, and uh, uh, so the idea here is that we have a, a, a language where there are no proper names or pronouns, but, but uh, where the subject of every sentence is the speaker or the, the person that utters the, the, the sentence. So, uh, so until here we have a sort of, of distributed propositional logic where we have the, the different uh, points in, in the model. And, uh, and then uh, there, there's, uh, there's no connection between the, the, the different points in the model. But uh, to create a connection between the different uh, points in the model here, we can introduce modalities, and this is what Fryer talks about in, in the third citation here. Lacking names and pronouns, the only way that a speaker of this language would have at the, a, would have of describing the activities of other people would be by certain modalizings of his sentences. But so by adding modal logical machinery, by adding modal operators, we can jump to other perspectives and. And, uh, and, and look at, at uh, and evaluate propositions uh, as if they were, were spoken by, by other people. Okay, so, uh, so basically here we have modal logic where the points in the models, they stand for persons. So that's, that's the idea that, that was put forward here. And actually, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, the context in, in, in which Pryor suggested this uh, is related to the discussion about the philosophy of time and, and the four uh, degrees of, uh, of temporal involvement, but, but this is not the, the subject uh, of my talk here. So the idea is that we have a modal logic where, where the points in the models, they stand for persons. Okay. And, and now I'll describe how we extend this modal logic with hybrid logical machinery, as we uh, call it in, in the area of, of, of hybrid logic. Okay. 
So uh, we add a second sort of propositional symbols called nominals, ABC, and, uh, and, uh, and nominal is uh, true at exactly one time if the points in the model they stand for times, uh, or they are true at exactly one person if they stand for persons, or places if they stand for, for places. So, so this is the first piece of, of hyperlogical machinery. So using this new piece of machinery, we can formulate a statement like it is 5 o'clock May 10th, 2007. This statement here is put exactly one time, namely the time 5 o'clock uh, May 10th, 2007. So this is the first uh, piece of machinery. And if we think of, uh, or if we let the, the points in the, in the model represent persons, then uh, what we can formulate here is statements like I am Peter. If, uh, if uh, uh, Peter or Peter Ostrom or another Peter uh, say that, then it is true, mm. but if any other person says that, then it, it, is, it is false. So, so this is uh, basically um, nominals uh, in, or person propositions in the sense of, uh, of uh, egocentric logic. Okay. The second piece of hyperlogical machinery is what is uh, called a satisfaction operator. And for any nominal, what, what we do here is that we add a new model, modal operator and we pronounce it at A. And uh, a formula at A phi is true if and only if the formula phi is true at the point in the model that A is referred to. So if the points in the model they stand for, for times, then this formula, what this formula here says is that the formula phi is true at the time A refers to. So that, that's the second piece of hyperlogical machinery. So using this machinery, we can formulate statements like this one here. At 5 o'clock May, May 10, 2007, it is raining. So we can state that something happens at a, at a particular time. Similarly, we can state that, that a particular person is doing something. For example, Peter is running, John is bicycling, or whatever. So we, we, can, we can state that uh, using this new piece of, of machinery. So we started using standard modal logic, and then we add two pieces of machinery. We add nominals and we add satisfaction operators, and then we have the hyperlogic that I, I need for, for my purpose. Okay, so, uh, so that was the first part of my talk, and, and uh, everything here stems from prior, but the terminology has, has to some extent been, been, been changed. So, uh, introduction to natural deduction. Um, the idea in natural deduction is that, that we would like to mimic the way people they actually reason when you do when you are doing mathematics or when you are arguing from uh, uh, in the parliament or or if you are arguing with a child who is going to do the dishes today or whatever then you are often using natural deduction. Uh, and um, so th that's one idea behind natural deduction. Um, so natural deduction mimics certain natural ways we reason informally. Uh, another important piece of uh, machinery, in, or in, uh, another idea in natural deduction is that you can discharge assumptions. And you can see, you do the same, you do this in, in a mathematical argument, for example, and also if you try to analyze, again, what's going on when you are arguing in the parliament or other places. So you are often discharging assumptions. Okay, and here's a natural deduction system for propositional logic. Um, we have this discharge mechanism in action here, for example. So we are discharging the formula phi, uh, <clears throat> and we are obtaining a derivation of uh, phi implies psi from a derivation of psi on the assumption psi on the assumption phi here. Okay, 
So we have a discharge mechanism, and what we also have in natural reduction is that we have introduction and emulation rules. So here we have an introduction rule. We introduce a conjunction, and we eliminate conjunction. That's another feature of natural reduction. We can introduce and eliminate formulas. Okay. So. Uh, what was the I? There was an I, and maybe it's self evident. For instance, where you have the uh, where you have the, the discharge, and you come to the yes. This, the, the uh, I is. I, what, what is that? It is simply uh, the name of the oh. rule. So it stands for introduction, <laughs> and this stands for elimination. Yes. So it is just a sure. systematic way to sure. to name the rules. Okay. So what I've now told you about uh, is hybrid logic and natural deduction. The next thing that I would like to talk about is uh, a natural deduction system for hybrid logic introduced by Jerry Seligman, a philosopher, from, a philosopher from New Zealand. I don't know, Jack, do you happen to know? Uh, um, uh, we write to each other sometimes, but uh -huh. I've never met him. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. But, uh, but uh, this natural deduction system that I'm going to talk about now was introduced by Jerry Seligman in the, in the late 90s. And uh, then it, it, uh, it was uh, dormant for some years, and, and then I took it up in, I think, in 2004 or something like that. And, and now it has uh, gained momentum again. Klaus and I and, and Patrick and, and Thomas Borland from the Technical University have published uh, uh, a paper on it, and, and we, are, we have just submitted another paper on, on, on Seligman. Not natural reduction, but Seligman style tableau systems. So it has gained momentum again, these uh, particular sorts of, of uh, natural reduction systems. Okay, so how do they look? We take the rule for propositional logic, which I showed you before, and then we add rules for the at operator. And the exact nature of these rules. Uh, uh, I'm going to skip a lot of details about, uh, about that, but but, um, but the important thing is that, that they fit at least to, to some extent into this introduction and elimination pattern. For example, here's an introduction rule for the at operator, and here's an elimination rule for the at operator. And what the introduction rule says is that, that if we are at the time A, now I, I take the points in the models as standing for times, if we are at the time A, and the formula phi is true, then at A, which is where we are now, phi holds that is phi is true at the present time. Okay. You can also explain it in terms of, uh, of uh, spatial uh, representation of, of uh, spatial loca locations. And, uh, and th this is uh, the example given originally by Jerry Seligman. And, uh, if we imagine that the nominal A stands for, this is Bloomington, this is a city in the US, and phi here stands for the sun is shining, then we are entitled to conclude that the sun is shining in Bloomington. So, uh, so the idea here is that we extend our propositional natural deduction system with rules for uh, for the edge operator or the satisfaction operator that, that fits this pattern. Um, and also we, can also we can also add rules for, for the modal operators, but, but I'll leave them out for now because they're not relevant for what, I, for what I'm going to, to do. Okay, but it turns out that this is not enough. We need two additional rules. This is the first one. I don't want to go into detail with that. And then we need this one as well. <coughs> this is more complicated, so it, it uh, it takes some, uh, uh, it needs to be explained. Okay, what the rule here does is that it allows to, to take a, a journey, so to speak, to a hypothetical time and then go back again to where you came from. So, uh, so the term rule here, as it named, now enables you to perform some hypothetical reasoning enables that, uh, you to reason about 
a, a place where, uh, where you might be and perform some reasoning there and then go back again. And uh, uh, seen from a more syntactic or proof theoretic point of view, what you are doing here is that you are encapsulating a piece of argument. Like you are imagining you are uh, at another place than you actually are, and then you're doing some reasoning, and then you jump back. It corresponds to encapsulating a piece of, of reasoning uh, that, that are, are supposed to take place at a particular time or place or a particular person or whatever. And there are some technical conditions here that I, I will skip because I, I won't like to, to, to talk about these psychological tests. But uh, perhaps the, the best way to understand it is to to phrase it in terms of, of boxes in linear logic. You, you, I, I, I don't know how many of you know about linear logic, but this is not so important here. But the idea is that in linear logic, you, you can encapsulate a piece of argument here. And, and what you're doing is simply that you are putting a box around it. And then you have formulas here that you reintroduce, and you reintroduce the, the formula here again to the phi here, which is at the inside here, crops up at the outside here, and similarly for, for the formulas phi of 1 up to phi n. And then we have the nominal here, and this nominal represents the hypothetical time, place, or person that you are reasoning at. And th there are some technicalities here that I would like to, 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 to skip, but, uh, but it can be worked out. Technically, okay, and and then there's the work where we uh, together with Klaus and and Thomas Blander and and Patrick where we work on tableau system where we are working on on, on similar hypothetical reasoning styles. Okay, so uh, to to sum up, I took the standard propositional natural deduction rules, and I added rules for the, uh, for the at, or the satisfaction operator. I had introduction and elevation rules, and then added two more rules, and this is one of them. And then we get a complete system. And I'll now show how you can use this to, to, uh, uh, to formalize the, uh, a psychological test called uh, the Salian test. Okay, so to sum up from the start, we took Pryor's hybrid logic, which Pryor invented for philosophical reasons in connection with the philosophy of, of time. Then we interpreted uh, the, the nominals as standing for persons, for times, or for places, whatever we like. Okay, and now we wanted to use it in the context of cognitive psychology. Okay, so the, <clears throat> the Salian test is one out of uh, a family of tests called, called forced belief tests. And, uh, and there, as a, there are a number of different versions of, of or a number of different kinds of false belief tests. And, and they have, uh, they're widely used in, in, in psychology and, and it turns out that that, uh, that uh, children, they learn to, to solve these tests or to give a correct answer on, of these, on these tests at about uh, the age of, of four. So, so here's a, a graph taken from a, a meta-analysis by Willman and, and others. And what they did was that they, they took a number of uh, 178 individual false belief studies and then they, they put them into, into one uh, statistical analysis and, uh, and out came this diagram here. And, and what you can see is that, that uh, we have uh, the proportional of correct answers. Uh, and the proportion is one that is 100% here and 50% here. So at about the age of uh, uh, between 40 or 50 months, uh, more than 50% of the, the children, they are able to give a correct answer. So, so they are above chance uh, when they answer correctly above chance when they pass this age. So there's rock hard psychological evidence for, for, uh, 
for uh, the, uh, the reality of whatever these tests they, they are, are measuring. And, and these tests, they have been carried out all over the world with all sorts of variations, uh, uh, different social uh, classes, uh, cultural context, uh, whatever. They, they are really uh, work hard. It seems like you have to do a little bit of fitting in order to get that graph. <laughs> oh, what? Uh, you, you mean this graph here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 but it, it's based on <laughs> our fitting, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fiddling. Yeah, but it, you, you can see it out of the picture here, for example, one spot here corresponds to one out of these 78 individual studies, so, so you can't see here how many kids and, and so forth, so they, they might not have the same weight. Okay. So here's the Salian test. Okay. So a child is presented with this cartoon here. And it's, it, the, the first scene here, in the first scene, there are two, uh, two dolls here. And uh, Sally, that, that's the girl to the left, she has a basket, the other one, Anne, has a box. Then Sally has a marble, Sally puts it into the basket here, and then she leaves for a while, and she leaves the room, and, and she can't see what, what is going on. And then uh, during her, her absence, uh, the other girl, Anne, moves the, the marble here from the basket to the box. And then Sally comes back, and uh, the question is now, where will Sally look for her marble? And it turns out that if a child is below, four years uh, of, of age, then the child would reply that Sally will look here where the marble really is. But she will of course look in her basket because that was where she, she left it. And, and children above the age of, of four, they're able to <coughs> figure out that she will look in, in, in the, the basket. And so she'll look, look, look here. Okay. That, that goes back to a paper from 83. And a couple of years later, it was shown that autistic children, they have a delayed ability to give a correct answer. So that's one uh, reason for the psychological interest in, in the Salian test. Okay. Good. Okay. But uh, before we go to a, a more detailed analysis, then what is necessary to give a correct answer is that you have to, to be able to, to put yourself in, in Sally's shoes, so to speak. You have to take another perspective than your own to give a correct answer. You have to imagine being Sally, you leave the room and then you don't see that the marble is, uh, is moved from the basket to, to the box. And this is what autistic children, they are missing. And this is the reason why they give the incorrect answer. They are not able to put themselves in another child's shoes, so to speak. They are not able, able, to, inap they are not able to, in to imagine that they are, are another child. So basically, what it requires to give a correct answer is to be able to put yourself in another person's shoes. <coughs> okay be a bit more technical. Um, if we imagine that, that, that we now or we, we look at the, the child, uh, Peter, who is supposed to give a, a, an answer to, to the test, then uh, we need to consider three times here. We consider the time T0, where Sally leaves the scene, T1, when the marble is moved from the basket to the box, and then T2, which is after Sally has returned. So we need to consider three times to, to model what is going on here. And uh, the child Peter, who is, uh, who is tested then, to give the correct answer, Peter imagines being Sally, and he reasons as follows. At T0, T0 Sally believes the marble is in the basket because she has put it there. Um, and uh, 
then she leaves the room, and when she leaves the room, there's no sign that, that anybody will, will move the, the, the marble. Then uh, at uh, T1, when she comes back, she still believes that the marble is in the basket she, since she has not seen Anna moving it at the time T1. So we call that T1 is where, when Anna moves the marble, and, but, but, uh, but Sally does not see that because, because she is absent. So uh, Peter concludes that Sally at T2 believes that the marble is still in the basket because Sally didn't see that, that it was moved. So, so that, that's a, a, a slightly more detailed recapitulation of the reasoning Peter is performing while he's giving a correct answer to, to, um, to this test here. And it turns out that, that this can be formalized in, in, in hybrid logic. Um, so the main assumption in our work is that, that uh, to give a correct answer, you perform a shift to the perspective of a different person, namely Sally, and then you could jump back again. And uh, the way that we do that more precisely is that, that uh, we um, take the points in the Kripke model or prior model of modal logic and then let them stand for persons. So then, then we are back to prior egocentric logic. And then we use satisfaction operators to jump between local perspectives. So this is the basic assumptions of, of our work here. Okay. And uh, in a short while I'll show you the formalization. I don't intend to go into details here, but, but the important thing is that I'm using some assumptions in this proof. One assumption is, is this principle of inertia here. We call that, that uh, when Peter, the child, was reasoning about Anna's, no, uh, about Sally's uh, knowledge, then he knew that Sally believed that the marble was in the basket before she left the scene. And then she wasn't aware of what was going on when she was away. Then she came back and she wasn't aware that Anna had moved the marble in the meantime. And this is formalized in this axiom here. And what it says is that where well, B stands for believe that, so it's a modal operator here. P stands for the marble is in the basket at the time t, and M stands for the marble is moved at the time t. Okay. So what this action here say, say is that if that is that if the person that is doing the believing, Sally in this case here, if she at time t believes that the marble is in the basket, and it is not the case that she believes that it is moved at the time t, then at the next time she still believes that the marble is in the basket. So, and this is encapsulated by this action here. And this is, by the way, a, a standard, uh, what is it called, a successor state action, which uh, also can be used to, to solve the, the so-called frame problem from, from uh, uh, artificial intelligence. And by the way, exactly the same principle crops up in psychology, where it is called uh, object preservation. It's interesting that you have the same sort of problems in artificial intelligence and in psychology, but it goes under, under, different, under different names. Okay, so this is coded up using this principle of inertia. <coughs> then there are some other principles here. For example, this principle says that if an agent, Sally or whoever, believe something, then it's not the case that she believes the opposite also. The knowledge is consistent. We, we need that in our formalization. I'll skip the other actions. And this is how the formalization look. And, and uh, I don't intend to go into details here. Don't fear. But, uh, but uh, what I've used here is simply these principles that I showed you, and then the term rule, the, the box rule here. And the box rule here in, encapsulates or uh, corresponds to the jump of perspective that the child solving the test 
performs when he puts himself in Sally's shoes. So this is uh, encapsulated by the box rule. And if you look at the assumptions here, you can see we have three formulas here in, as, as assumptions. Then we have one conclusion. And uh, all the, the formulas here, they are discharged, so we, we can, can disregard them. But if we take the, the, the first formula here, for example, a stands for Sally, so the, by uh, th this formula here says that Sally sees P at T0, where P uh, means that uh, Mabel is in the basket. So at T0, Sally sees that the Mabel is in, the marble is in the, the basket. And, and there are similar explanations for the other formula, and then you conclude that that Sally believes that at T2 the marble is in the basket. This is a conclusion. This is the correct answer. So we have some uh, assumptions here about the perception of Sally, and then we draw a conclusion here that that tells you what the correct answer is. Okay. Good. And then there are some summing up that I'll, I'll skip. Uh, yeah. uh, how I'm, am I doing on time, Klaus? Mm. 10 minutes or, well, 20 minutes. I think you, uh, you have uh, uh, 10, 15. 10, 15, okay, good. So I have time to talk about uh, ongoing work. So to sum up, we took prior egocentric logic added hyperlogical machinery, which actually Pryor did himself also, and then I used it to formalize this uh, psychological test in, in, in a way I, I think is reasonably faithful to the actual reasoning when, when giving a correct answer. Further work. Uh, what I showed you here is a, a so-called first order false belief test. Um, and uh, children there, as I told you before, are able to solve it about at the age four. And uh, what is going on and th is that, that uh, in a first order false belief test, as for example the Sally Ann test that I showed you, you are testing whether a child can realize that somebody else, Sally, can hold a false belief of the state of affairs, namely position, the position of the marble. Okay, so this is what you're testing in the first order case. Uh, one thing that, that I've uh, looked at recently is second order false belief test. And they are, they are somewhat harder. They are, it, you, kids there are usually five, between five or seven b before they're able to solve uh, such tests. And what they are doing is that they are testing whether a child can realize that someone, someone else can hold a false belief about someone else's belief out of, out, uh, on, uh, about the state of affairs. So it's a, a bit more complicated. Okay. And, uh, and here's an example of a false belief test. It is called the ice cream truck story. And uh, it's about uh, John and Mary, two children, they are playing in, in, in a park, and then they see an ice cream truck uh, in the park. And uh, what happens then is that they split up and go home. And then after they split up and after they have come home, they are both told that the ice cream truck has moved to, to the church. But, uh, but neither of them knows that the other one has got this piece of information. So, so they leave the, the park, and they're both told that the ice cream truck has, has uh, moved from the park to the church, but they don't know the other one knows it. The test question is then, where does John think that Mary is, will go to buy ice cream? And John thinks that Mary will go to the park to to buy ice cream because John does not know that Mary has been told that the ice cream truck has moved from the park to, to the, the church. And uh, as I said before, it turns out that, 
that the children then need a couple of years more before they're able to give correct answers to, to this, uh, to this uh, question here. And uh, um, I'm interested in formalizing such uh, reasoning trust in the context of a, a, a project that is funded by the, the Danish Velux Foundation. So I'm, I'm interested in analyzing this logic in the same way as, as, as I analyzed the Salian, um, the, the Salian task, and, and there are a number of, of unresolved issues in connection with this uh, task here that, that, that I'm interested in. Um, it turns out that first order false belief it co correspond or correlates statistically with certain linguistic tests called the sentential complement test. And this is an example of a sentential complement test. Tom thinks that it is sunny outside, although it is really raining. This is what the child is told. Then the test question is, will Tom now put his raincoat on? And the answer is no, because Tom thinks that it is sunny outside. Tom does not think. Uh, Tom does not know that it is actually raining, and uh, it turns out that ch the children they are able to uh, to give correct answers to such uh, questions here between the age, uh, age, uh, age three and, and, and four, and there's a lot of literature where where uh, one one hypothesis is that the ability to solve such linguistic tests here when, when you are able to distinguish what is actually the case from what people believe about the world. It turns out that if you are able to do that, then uh, you are also able to solve false belief tests. There is a raw cost of statistical evidence uh, on, on that and, uh, and, and there is uh, there's a source for, for this knowledge here. But, but it is a matter of ongoing research. And, uh, and what uh, I have been interested in together with uh, Irina Polianska, who uh, is a PhD student employed uh, by, by this VILU project, and Patrick, who is also involved in the project, and, and, and also Klaus is, uh, uh, has been actively involved recently. What we are interested in is that Okay, first order false belief tests, they correspond to sentence, sentential complement tests. There's rock hard evidence for that. What does second order belief test correspond to? It's simply an open question. There, there's no uh, literature on, on that, and we have been looking uh, on that recently. And Irina, she's, she's, actually, she's actually originally a philosopher, but she also has a degree in psychology from Copenhagen. And, and she's going to do a, a, a PhD on, on, on that. And uh, um, there seems to be do, do two different sorts of, of answers here, depending on, on how you would explain this capacity to give an answer to second order false beliefs questions, whether it is something conceptual that is going on when you move from the ability to to solve first order test to, to solve second order test, or whether it is simply an information processing, processing question where you have to keep track of more information to give a correct answer. Uh, okay, so, so that's, that's some recent work that, that I'm doing together with other people in this connection here. And there are a number of other issues that are of interest. So. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop here and then uh, just finish by saying that this is one example of application of, of Pryor's, uh, Pryor's uh, ecocentric logic. And here are some sources of information if you're interested. <coughs> I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here. And yes.